China-Russia relations, also known as Sino-Russian relations, refers to international relations between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. Diplomatic relations between China and Russia dramatically improved after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the establishment of the Russian Federation in 1991. American scholar Joseph Nye argues, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that de facto U.S.-China alliance ended, and a China-Russia rapprochement began. In 1992, the two countries declared that they were pursuing a constructive partnership. In 1996, they progressed toward a strategic partnership, and in 2001, they signed a treaty of friendship and cooperation. The two countries share a long land border which was demarcated in 1991, and they signed a Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation in 2001. On the eve of a 2013 state visit to Moscow by Chinese President Xi Jinping, Russian President Vladimir Putin remarked that the two nations were forging a special relationship. The two countries have been enjoying close partnership militarily, economically, politically and culturally, while sharing the same stance and supporting each other in numerous global issues. General Secretary of the Communist Party of China Paramount Leader and President of the Russian Federation since 1991. History China and the USSR were rivals after the Sino-Soviet split in 1961, competing for control of the worldwide communist movement. There was a serious possibility of a major war in the early 1960s, a brief border war took place in 1969. This enmity began to lessen after the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, but relations were poor until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. On December 23, 1992, Russian President Boris Yeltsin made his first official visit to China. In December 1998, at the end of Prime Minister Li Peng's visit to Moscow, Russia and China issued a joint communique pledging to build an equal and reliable partnership. This reinforced the Sino Russian view that the United States was their main competitor in the global political scene. In 2001, the close relations between the two countries were formalized with the Treaty of Good Neighborliness and Friendly Cooperation, a 20-year strategic, economic, and, controversially and arguably, an implicit military treaty. A month before the treaty was signed, the two countries joined with junior partners Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization SCO. The organization is expected to counter the growing influence of the United States military outreach program in Central Asia. The PRC is currently a key purchaser and licensee of Russian military equipment, some of which has been instrumental in the modernization of the People's Liberation Army. It is also a main beneficiary of the Russian Eastern Siberia – Pacific Ocean oil pipeline. By 2019, both nations had serious grievances with the United States. For China the issues were control of the South China Sea, trade policies, and piracy of American technology. For Russia, the main issue was severe economic penalties imposed by the US and Europe to punish its seizure of the Crimea from Ukraine. China and Russia differ on some policies. China does not recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea, and Russia does not support China's claims in the South China Sea. Russia also sells weapons to China's regional rivals, India and Vietnam. Nevertheless, China and Russia pulled together on the best terms since the late 1950s. There was no formal alliance, but an informal agreement to coordinate diplomatic and economic moves, and build up an alliance against the United States. Yaroslav Trofimov, the chief foreign affairs correspondent of The Wall Street Journal, argues in 2019, Though there is no overt ideological alignment between Russia and China today, the two governments share a hostility to dissent, deep suspicion of Western interference and a strong desire to impose tighter controls over their own societies. Mr. Xi has presided over a push to stamp out corruption and bolster the Communist Party's role in the economy and the society at large a campaign akin to Mr. Putin's earlier effort to tame Russian oligarchs and crush political opposition. China was inspired by Russia's legislation cracking down on non-governmental organizations, while Russian officials have expressed admiration for China's comprehensive internet censorship and social credit plan to rank citizens based on their loyalty and behavior. Topic: 
Topic: <inaudible> Border. On May 29, 1994, during the visit of Russian Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin to Beijing, Russian and Chinese officials signed an agreement on the Sino-Russian border management system intended to facilitate border trade and hinder criminal activity. On September 3 that year, a demarcation agreement was signed fixing the boundary along a disputed 55 km stretch of the western Sino-Russian border. The 2004 complementary agreement between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation on the eastern section of the China-Russia boundary stated that Russia agrees to transfer a part of a Bagaraitu islet, Holyanlong Tarabarov island, about a half of Bolshoi Ushariski island and some adjacent islets to China. A border dispute between Russia and China, standing since Japanese invasion of Manchuria of 1931, was resolved. These Amur River islands were until then administered by Russia and claimed by China. The event was meant to foster feelings of reconciliation and cooperation between the two countries by their leaders. The transfer has been ratified by both the Chinese National People's Congress and the Russian State Duma. The official transfer ceremony was held on site on October 14, 2008. The Republic of China, based on Taiwan, refused to relinquish its claims to parts of disputed islands remaining in Russian possession. Topic: <laughs> Economic relations. Economic relations between Russia and China demonstrate mixed trends. Trade between the two countries was running at between $5 billion and $8 billion per year in the 1990s, but grew steadily from then onwards. It was on course to hit $100 billion, the previous goal, until the 2008 crisis interceded. Trade slumped back to around $60 billion in 2015 and 2016 but started to recover again in 2017. Both countries are expecting to raise the trade volume to $200 billion by 2024. In 2008 2009, when Russia experienced a financial crisis, there was a sharp increase in borrowing from China. But this trend did not last more than a year or two. However, starting from 2013, the borrowing started growing steadily. It appears that Russia turns to the Chinese when it needs cash. Most of Russia's exports to China are from the mining and petrochemicals sector, the main form of cooperation in the overall complex of economic relations between Russia and China is trade. In 2003 to 2013, the mutual trade turnover increased 7.7 .7 times. In 2014, the scale of bilateral operations increased even more. The aggravation of relations between Russia and Western countries has contributed to the expansion of economic ties with China. By 2020, the parties plan to increase bilateral trade to $200 billion. According to the Federal S. Ustoms Service FCS of the Russian Federation, in 2016 the foreign trade turnover of Russia and China amounted to $66.1 billion in 2015 $63.6 .6 billion. Russia has a negative trade balance with China. In 2016, exports amounted to 28 billion, imports 38.1 billion in 2015, respectively 28.6 and 35.9 billion. The share of China in foreign trade of Russia grew from 12.1% in 2015 to 14.1% in 2016. Since 2010, China is the largest trading partner of Russia. More than half of Russia's exports to China come from mineral fuels, oil and petroleum products 60.7%, followed by wood and wood products 9.4%, non-ferrous metals 9%, fish and seafood 3.5%, chemical products 3.3%. The main categories of imports to Russia from China are machinery and equipment 35.9%, clothing 13.7%, chemical products 9.1%, fur and fur products 5.6%, footwear 5.3%, and furniture 3%. 
According to the General S. Ustoms Administration of China, bilateral trade in January to May 2017 increased by 26.1% in annual terms, amounting to $32.3 billion, and mutual trade in 2017 may exceed $80 billion according to the Ministry of Commerce of China. As of January 1, 2016, the volume of accumulated direct Russian investments in China amounted to $946.9 million and Chinese investments, 10 times more. They are estimated at $8.94 billion. Participation in such organizations as BRICS and RIC Russia -India -China has a significant importance for Russian-Chinese economic relations. At the Russian-Chinese summit held in Shanghai, Vladimir Putin and Eleven Jinping stressed that Russia and China stand for the transformation of BRICS into a mechanism of cooperation and coordination on a wide range of global financial, economic and international political problems, including the establishment of a closer economic partnership, the early establishment of the BRICS Development Bank and the formation of A, for the expansion of joint efforts of representation and voting rights of states with emerging markets and developing countries in the system of global economic governance governance, for the formation of an open world economy, for the deepening of cooperation in the field of foreign policy, including in the settlement of regional conflicts." The next mutually beneficial step is to conclude a currency swap. The purpose of this agreement is to facilitate financial transactions in the regions. Central banks, with whom China has signed currency swaps, can issue loans to their banks in yuan. A currency swap agreement was signed with Russia in the amount of 150 billion yuan $25 billion. Currency swaps will make the ruble and the yuan more stable, which in turn will have a positive impact on the stability of the global financial system. Also, the expansion of currency trading should facilitate investment processes. By investing in an economy that is now facing certain problems due to the fall of the ruble and oil prices, China is carrying out soft expansion and supports one of its main partners. China and Russia have long advocated reducing the role of the dollar in international trade. The goal is to create conditions for the development of bilateral trade and mutual investment, do not have to buy currency in the market. A logical step, given the closure of foreign capital markets, the growth of mutual trade and long-term contracts for the supply of Russian energy to China. The move away from the dollar seems justified in terms of reducing exchange rate risks. The rate of de-dollarization chosen by the countries is due to the rapid growth of the RMB's share in international payments and settlements October 2013. 0.84% December 2014. 2.17% February 2015 At 1.81% the conclusion of a currency swap makes it possible to facilitate payments as there is an imitation of the internal currency which speeds up the transfer procedure and minimizes the cost of conversion In 2013 China initiated the creation of the economic zone the New Silk Road this project is designed primarily to strengthen economic ties and cooperation, attract investors from Asia and other parts of the world to actively participate in the creation of the Silk Road Economic Belt of the 21st century. The zone should extend from China to Europe through Central Asia and Russia. An important role in the financing of these projects should be played by the creation of the AIIB, to which Russia is a party. In recent years, China and Russia have stepped up cooperation in the construction of cross-border infrastructure. New Eurasian transport routes are being built, the railway, Chongqing Xinjiang Europe, the route, Western Europe, Western China, which will pass through Russia. In northeast China and the Russian Far East, both countries are actively promoting the construction of bridges, ports and other projects. It is planned to increase the volume of bilateral trade between China and Russia to $200 billion by the end of 2020. The countries should take advantage of a unique opportunity, and by combining the development programs of the two states, to achieve joint development and prosperity. Russia is interested in cooperation with the countries of the Eurasian Economic Union it is the creation of the EAEU that will serve as an important platform for multilateral cooperation in the region, as all participants are good neighbors and partners of Russia, as well as traditional partners of China. 
Russia is interested in creating a free trade zone of the EAEU and China, as well as the use of the national currency in this region. Energy relations Since the dissolution of the USSR in 1991, energy relations between China and Russia have been generally marked by cooperation and a regard for mutual geopolitical and strategic interests. China's fast-growing economy places increasing pressure on itself to secure energy imports, while Russia's economy is largely driven by the demand for the export of natural resources. China became a petroleum importer for the first time in 1993, had become the world's second largest oil consuming country as of 2011, and the world's largest overall energy consumer as of 2010. In a report released January 2012, the China Petroleum and Chemical Industry Federation estimated that the country's crude oil consumption would increase to 480 million tons in 2012, or 9.6 million barrels per day. The group also forecast that natural gas consumption would rise 15.3% to 148.2 billion cubic meters BCD. Given its geographical proximity to China and position as one of the world's largest oil producers and natural gas exporters, Russia has been an obvious candidate for meeting this increased demand. While energy relations have been primarily related to oil, gas, and coal, there have also been partnerships with regard to nuclear and renewable wind and water energy technology. From the mid 1990s, when the tightening of global energy markets coincided with his rise to power, Russian President Vladimir Putin has signaled the importance of oil and particularly natural gas for Russia's emergence as a global power. Long-term prospects for Russian gas exports to China will be affected by several global pricing trends. Surges in liquefied natural gas LNG capacity, the increasingly competitive nature of Central Asian gas supplies, advances in shale gas technology, and potential greenhouse gas policies may all impact Chinese consumption. Despite frequent declarations of goodwill and bilateral energy cooperation, Chinese Russian energy relations since 1991 have been limited by mutual suspicions, pricing concerns, inadequate transportation infrastructure, and competition for influence in Eurasia. Russian leaders have expressed growing concerns regarding Chinese, Japanese and Korean settlement in the energy-rich but sparsely populated Russian Far East as well as increased Chinese investment in and control of Russian energy ventures. China's growing oil and gas partnerships with former Soviet Central Asian republics like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan have also been a source of conflict, as Chinese policy makers act warily in this region given Moscow's traditional dominant regional influence. See references below. History The official relationship between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation has been upgraded three times since the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1991. Beginning as good neighborly and mutually beneficial in December 1992, it evolved into a constructive partnership in September 1994, and finally a strategic partnership of coordination in April 1996. In September 1999, the two countries began joint construction of a nuclear power station at Lianyungang, Jiangsu Province with an installed capacity of 2 million kilowatts, one of the first situations of mutual energy cooperation. The late 1990s also marked the beginning of feasibility studies for natural gas and oil pipeline projects in western and eastern Siberia. In 2001, Russian company Yukos proposed the unprecedented Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean oil pipeline project, which would link Yukos's oil refinery in Angarsk to Daking, in northern China. At the time, rail routes were the only means of transporting oil into the growing Chinese market. The project stalled in October 2003, when Yukos chief executive Mikhail Khodorkovsky was arrested on charges including tax evasion and fraud, and the Russian government launched an immediate investigation into the company. 
Many speculated that the series of events were politically motivated, given that Mr. Khodorkovsky had been a vocal opponent of President Putin. A week after Mr. Khodorkovsky's arrest, China Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Zhang Qiyui publicly announced that the Kremlin investigation would not impact the proposed China Russia oil pipeline project. In September 2004, Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao met with Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Fradkov in Moscow, where the two heads of government signed agreements affirming Russia's promised to set the route of a proposed pipeline from eastern Siberia to the Pacific, with priority given to laying a pipeline spur to China, as well as to increase rail oil exports to China to 10 million tons BD in 2005 and 15 million tons BD in 2006. Four days before Wen's visit, Yukos, then the largest supplier of Russian oil to China and Russia's biggest oil producer, publicly announced that rail shipments of crude oil to the China National Petroleum Corporation CNPC would end beginning on September 28, 2004. The Kremlin had begun auctioning off the troubled company's operating assets a month prior in August. Gazprom, Soyuzneftegaz, and the Chinese embassy in Moscow all expressed interest in Yugansneftegaz, a main arm of Yukos. The subsidiary was ultimately acquired by Russia's state-owned oil company Rosneft for roughly $9.3 billion. In February 2005, Russian Finance Minister Alexei Kudrin revealed that Chinese banks provided $6 billion in financing the Rosneft acquisition. This financing was reportedly secured by long-term oil delivery contracts between Rosneft and the CNPC. In the same month, the Chinese Foreign Ministry denied that China provided «funds» for the deal. The Foreign Ministry could not confirm whether there were any «loans» involved. Ministry spokesman Kong Quan said, state-owned Lukoil became China's largest Russian oil supplier when CNPC reached a strategic cooperation agreement with the company in September 2006. As promised during Premier Wen's visit to Moscow in 2004, construction on a direct pipeline spur to China began in March 2006, when CNPC signed an agreement providing state oil producer Transneft $400 million for constructing a pipeline from Skovorodino, about 70 kilometers (43 miles) from the Chinese border. In the same month, CNPC agreed to a set of principles establishing future joint ventures with Rosneft. In 2006, Gazprom was made responsible for all exports of gas from Russia's eastern Siberian fields, outside of sales made through production sharing agreements PSAs. This was another move widely seen to be politically motivated, since successful commercial development of these fields and export to Asian markets would be impossible without Gazprom, and therefore Kremlin, involvement. Ibid. Two years prior, Gazprom acknowledged in an annual shareholder report a plan for supplying natural gas to China. Two routes, roughly equal in capacity, would be constructed, with a total volume of 68 billion cubic meters of gas per annum. An Altai pipeline would link West Siberian fields with the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in western China, while the eastern pipeline would run from Yakutia into northeastern China. Chinese domestic natural gas consumption roughly matched domestic production in 2004. Since then, however, its rate of growth and more sustainable energy profile compared to oil inevitably led to a surge in Chinese natural gas imports. In March 2006, CNPC signed a Memorandum of Understanding MOU with Gazprom for the delivery of natural gas to China, which officially began pricing negotiations between Gazprom Chief Executive Alexei Miller and Chen Geng, then head of the CNPC. In September 2007, the Russian Federation Industry and Energy Ministry approved a development plan for an integrated gas production, transportation, and supply system in eastern Siberia and the Far East, taking into account potential gas exports to China and other Asia-Pacific countries. Gazprom was appointed by the Russian government as the Eastern Gas Program Execution Coordinator. Russia's desire to diversify its export markets has been matched by China's willingness to invest in Russian energy production and infrastructure. Russian policymakers, however, have expressed reserve about increased Chinese influence in the energy sector. In 2002, CNPC attempted to bid for Russian oil firm Slavneft, but withdrew just weeks later. International news sources suggested the bid failed partly due to anti-foreign sentiment in the Duma, Russia's lower parliamentary house. 
Slavneft was privatized by Parity Owners TNK later OAO -TNK -BP and Sibneft later OAO Gazprom Neft soon afterwards. In 2004, Slavneft was then acquired by TNK BP, the product of a merger between the Alpha Access Renova Consortium Alpha Group and British Petroleum BP. .In 2006, Russia denied CNPC a significant stake in OAO Rosneft. When the Russian company went public, CNPC was allowed to purchase $500 million worth of shares, one-sixth of the $3 billion it had sought. The financial crisis triggered in 2008 gave China its opportunity to invest in Russia on a grander scale through a Loans for Oil program. In 2009 and 2010, China's long-term energy-backed loans EBL extended large sums of capital to companies and entities not only in Russia, but also in Brazil, Ecuador, Turkmenistan and Venezuela, IBAD. Growing Chinese investment is speculated to be about more than energy security for China. Chinese news agency Xinhua reported in 2010 that many Chinese enterprises believe the Russian market will allow them to become truly global. Gao Zhizhang, Associate Research Fellow of the Russian Economy Research Office of the Russia, East Europe, and Central Asia Research Institute of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, reported that China's investments in Russia totaled $1.374 billion as of 2007, and were projected to reach $12 billion by 2020. In 2008–09 alone, total investments rose 25.4% to $2.24 billion and direct investment went from $240 million to $410 million. 2009 marked the 60th anniversary of established diplomatic relations between Moscow and Beijing, and also coincided with the signing of over 40 contracts worth roughly $3 billion. President Hu Jintao of China and President Dmitry Medvedev of Russia conferred three times in four days during mid-June at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Yekaterinburg, at the first ever heads of state meeting of the BRIC countries Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and again when Hu made a state visit to Moscow from June 16 to 18, representing what many saw to be a high water mark in Chinese-Russian relations, growing economic closeness also seemed to suggest a growing political alliance. In an interview with China Central TV on the day of Hu's arrival in Russia, Medvedev cited the high-level exchanges and other bilateral achievements in what both governments refer to as their «strategic partnership» as evidence of what he called «the highest level of ties in the history of Russian-Chinese relations». A joint statement released by the two heads of state expanded upon how the two governments usually pledge mutual support for their sovereignty and territorial integrity. The Russian government explicitly affirmed that Tibet along with Taiwan are "...inalienable parts of the Chinese territory," while the Chinese supported "...Russia's efforts in maintaining peace and stability in the region of Caucasus." During Hu's visit, however, Gazprom announced it could not begin delivering natural gas to China in 2011 as planned, because of pricing disagreements. Construction of the Western Siberian Altai pipeline, which could deliver over 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas annually to China, was supposed to begin in 2008. A senior Gazprom official observed, "...as soon as there is a price, we will start the construction, but this is a complicated issue." September 27, 2010 marked the completion of the 1,000-kilometer Russia-China crude pipeline. Stretching from Russia's Skovorodino station to China's MOHE station, it was the first pipeline ever built between China and Russia. In April 2009, Rosneft and Transneft had signed deals with CNPC guaranteeing the pipeline's production of 300,000 barrels of crude oil per day for 20 years as part of a $25 billion loan for oil agreement. Upon the pipeline's completion in 2010, CNPC also signed a general agreement with Transneft over the operation of the pipeline, a framework agreement with Gazprom to import natural gas to China from 2015 onwards, an agreement with Rosneft on extending oil supply to the Russia-China crude pipeline, and an agreement with Lukoil on expanding strategic cooperation. Both sides hailed the series of agreements as a new era in cooperation, and Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Igor Sechin told reporters in Beijing that Russia was "...ready to meet China's full demand in gas." 
Going forward. Ibid. Andrei Slepnev, a Russian deputy economic development minister, announced in 2009 that Russia and China not only had good prospects for cooperation in oil and gas, but also nuclear power engineering as well as space exploration. In September 2010, President Putin reaffirmed the potential nuclear future of Russia and China's energy relations, saying, of course, our cooperation with China is not limited to just hydrocarbons. Russia is China's main partner in the field of peaceful use of nuclear energy, and equipment supplies here amount to billions of dollars. However, as of 2011, Russian officials have remained reluctant to transfer nuclear energy technologies and other knowledge products to Chinese partners. Industry experts have pointed out that while proprietary technology would protect Russian exports from being displaced by lower-cost Chinese products in third-party markets, such an approach may reinforce Chinese doubts about Russia's reliability as a long-term energy partner. The Russian oil industry has not only been burdened by corporate struggles such as with UCOS and political disagreements between the countries, but also by the reoccurring breaches in safety. From the Kazakh riots to endless environmental concerns, but most recently the capsizing of an oil platform that was allowed to operate in the north late in the season and was being towed under adverse maritime conditions. Incidents such as these cannot help but give potential foreign investment, which the region needs, pause as to the reliability of Russian energy supplies. Russian Far East RFE. In 1996, the Russian Federation completed two production sharing agreements PSA for oil and gas exploration off the northeast coast of the Sakhalin Islands. The Sakhalin I project, operated by Exxon Neftigas Limited (ENL), has estimated potential recoverable reserves are estimated at 307 million tons of oil, 2.3 billion BBN, and 485 billion cubic meters of gas as of 2002. ENL, a subsidiary of US-based ExxonMobil, holds a 30% interest in the project while Rosneft holds 20% via its affiliates RN Astra 8.5% and Sakhalin Morneftigas Shelf 11.5%. Japanese consortium SODECO and Indian state-owned oil company ONGC Vidish Limited holds the remaining 50% 30 and 20%, respectively. The Sakhalin 2 project is managed by the Sakhalin Energy Investment Company Limited As of 2011, Russian state monopoly Gazprom holds 50% plus one share, Royaldutch Shell 27.5%, Mitsui 12.5% and Mitsubishi 10%. Gazprom purchased its majority stake from Sakhalin 2 operator Royal Dutch Shell in 2006. The project had been placed permanently on hold by environmental regulators, but moved forward after the sale. The series of events led to widespread speculation that environmental violations may have been used to as a bargaining chip in the deal. Sakhalin 2 consists of two 800 km pipelines running from the northeast of the island to Prigorodnoy Prigorodno in Aniva Bay at the southern end. The consortium built Russia's first liquefied natural gas LNG plant at Prigorodnoy. Industry sources speculated that, "...some in Russia hope to sell China gas from Sakhalin 2's or other facilities' future LNG holdings now that it has mastered the technology." Sakhalin 2 LNG first started flowing in 2009, heading to markets in Japan, South Korea and the United States. In December 2003, CNPC and Sakhalin Energy signed a frame agreement on exploration and development in Russia's Sakhalin oilfield. ExxonMobil also looked towards the Chinese market, making preliminary agreements on supplying Sakhalin I gas to China as early as 2002. On November 2, 2004, CNPC began negotiations with ExxonMobil on possible long term gas deliveries from Sakhalin 1. Negotiations were concluded in October 2006, when Exxon and CNPC officially announced an agreement. Under the deal, Sakhalin 1 could sell up to 10 billion cubic meters of gas to China over 20 years by pipeline. The plan met strong opposition from Gazprom, which has a rival pipeline project and controls all Russian gas exports apart from sales through PSAs such as Sakhalin 1. 
In August 2006, Sakhalin I's de Castri oil terminal began exporting processed petroleum to markets including China, Japan, and South Korea. The influence of Russia's regional energy trade has led to a sense of local uneasiness as to the foreign country's influence. In 2000, President Putin warned a Siberian audience that unless Russia intensified the region's development, the Russian Far East would end up speaking Chinese, Japanese and Korean. In 2002, the Deputy Secretary of the Russian Security Council, Vladimir Potapov, expressed serious concerns about the region's combined remoteness, weak infrastructure, declining population, and wealth, in very diverse resources. Political figures like Viktor Ozerov, chairman of the Federation Council's Defense and Security Committee, warned of military threats in the Far East and decried the predatory use of the region's resources, and large-scale illegal immigration, though scholars pointed out that no imminent threat was visible. Dmitry Trenin stated that, the principal domestic reason is the situation of eastern Russia, especially East Siberia and the Russian Far East. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the territories have been going through a deep crisis. The former model of their development is inapplicable, a new model is yet to be devised and implemented. Meanwhile, the vast region has been going through depopulation, deindustrialization, and general degradation. The quality of Moscow's statesmanship will be tested by whether it can rise up to the challenge in the East. The RFE has been one of the most difficult areas to transition between the structure of the Soviet Union and the still developing Russian state due to the lack of economic self sufficiency in the region or any prospects of stable growth. In September 2005, the Minister of Economic Development and Trade German Greff promised a doubling of state support for the RFE to $612 million in 2006, and consideration of allocating a new $2.5 billion infrastructure fund for projects there. A year later, at the end of 2006, Putin reiterated that the socio-economic isolation of the RFE represented a threat to national security, and advocated yet another new socio-economic commission and regional development strategy to be formed. He specifically pointed to the perceived threat of foreign immigration in the Far East. Scholars and regional experts have suggested that China's rapid economic growth especially relative to Russia's GDP growth rate lies at the bottom of anxieties concerning the RFE. While the Russian and Chinese economies were roughly the same size in 1993, China's grew to over 3.5 times larger than Russia's by 2008. Even since 1998, when Russia began a rapid economic recovery, China has grown at a faster rate. The gap has only widened since the global economic crisis and falling energy prices of the late 2000s. China's growth has led to the creation of new productive capacity, whereas Russia's recovery has been based largely on reutilizing Soviet era capacity that had idled in the early 1990s. China's growing appetite for raw materials therefore coincides with Russia's increasing dependency on foreign investment. Russian officials have repeatedly reiterated their opposition to being merely China's natural resources storehouse. As early as 2001, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Alexei Kudrin warned that if Russia failed to become a worthy economic partner for Asia and the Pacific Rim, China and the Southeast Asian countries will steamroll Siberia and the Far East." At the start of his presidency in September 2008, Dmitry Medvedev echoed similar concerns, warning a Kamchatka audience that if Russia fails to develop the RFE it could turn into a raw material base for more developed Asian countries and, "...unless we speed up our efforts, we can lose everything." Regional experts have pointed out that despite these increasingly vocal concerns, the local economy of the RFE has become increasingly reliant on Chinese goods, services, and labor over the past decade. Furthermore, local out migration shows little sign of reversing. For all the early promise under Putin, Moscow's policy towards the RFE has not seemed effective as of 2008. Dmitry Trenin of the Moscow branch of the Carnegie Endowment has argued that Siberia's development could become Russia's most urgent challenge. Failure to develop the region into more than a raw material outpost could lead to what he calls a Chinese takeover of the region, not by migration but rather by economic means of trade and investment. Ibid. 
Russia's plans for this region have revolved around building energy infrastructure to leverage exports and attracting investment so that the capital will be available for modernizing regional infrastructure. These plans largely depend on foreign investments, which Russian companies have grudgingly acknowledged. In 2008, a consortium of Chinese engineering firms led by Harbin Turbine signed an agreement with Russian power producer OGK to produce coal-fired turbines in the RFE, adding 41,000 MW of new generating capacity by 2011. Stanislav Nevenitsyn, executive director of OGK, admitted. It is simply a necessity for us to work with the Chinese, we will not get the capacity built otherwise." Through loans to Russia's Bank for Development and Foreign Economic Affairs, Vichekonombank China became a major stockholder in Lukoil in 2009. In the same year, after having excluded foreign firms from bidding on the huge Udakan copper mine in southeast Siberia, Moscow welcomed Chinese, South Korean, and Kazakh miners and refiners back into the bidding process. As part of the Russia's energy strategy till 2020, the Russian government launched a program of creating a unified gas production, transportation, and supply system in eastern Siberia and the RFE in 2006. The program would ultimately provide affirmation of an all Russia gas system from the Baltic Sea up to the Pacific Ocean. Russian policymakers have also suggested building an international center for spent fuel and nuclear energy in the RFE, hoping to raise the profile in the export of nuclear energy to the global market. In 2009, Gazprom was awarded subsurface licenses for the Karinsky, Vostokno Odoptinsky, and Ayshsky blocks to begin the Sakhalin 3 project. Geological exploration has been underway at the Kirinskoy field and, as of 2009, natural gas production is scheduled for 2014. The field will become one of the natural gas sources for the Sakhalin Khabarovsk Vladivostok Gas Transmission System. The first GTS startup complex will be 1,350 km, with a capacity of 6 billion cubic meters per year. Central Asia In 1996, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Tajikistan formed the Shanghai Five, a collaborative body that was renamed the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with the addition of Uzbekistan in 2001. As members of the SCO, China and Russia have cooperated in military exercises like counter-terrorism drills in Kyrgyzstan in 2002 and in Kazakhstan and China in 2003. Russian and Chinese leaders regularly call for greater cooperation and coordination in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization between their two countries in the context of their broader goal of promoting of multilateral diplomacy. In a joint statement issued on May 23, 2008, Russia and China asserted that international security is comprehensive and inalienable, and some countries' security cannot be guaranteed at the cost of some others, including expanding military and political allies. Zhao Huisheng, director of Russian and Central Asian Studies at Fudan University's Shanghai Cooperation Center, has argued that economic cooperation will ensure the long term relevance of the SCO, as current security threats recede. While China and Russia do enjoy some bilateral energy cooperation, which experts predict will continue to grow in the future, the two countries have emerged as rivals for Central Asian oil and gas supplies. With the rise in the price of oil in the mid 2000s, Russia has sought to renew its influence in Central Asia, in particular the region's southern flank, to guarantee access to gas supplies for re export to Europe and for its own domestic needs. As China's energy needs have grown and its policymakers have sought to develop its western provinces, China, too, has sought to expand its influence in Central Asia. In 2007, at a meeting of SCO prime ministers in Tashkent, Russian Premier Viktor Zubtov reiterated Moscow's desire to forge a Central Asian energy club within the SCO, which comprises Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. The SCO Energy Club could be set up as soon as 2008. Russian Deputy Industry and Energy Minister Ivan Matirov announced in Tashkent. However, he insisted that the club would not amount to a sort of mini OPEC. 
Political and economic analysts in Moscow believe the Kremlin is keen to establish an energy club as a means to prevent a possible clash with China over Central Asia's energy resources. At a May 2007 SCO summit in Turkmenbashi, Russian, Kazakh, and Turkmen leaders announced the expansion of the Prikaspisky gas pipeline from Turkmenistan into Russia. The plan has stalled due to several obstacles, including price disagreements and the economic recession of the late 2000s. Ibad, uncertainty over the Prikaspisky route has given China an opening, especially in Turkmenistan. During a brief visit to Ashgabat, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao called for efforts to step up bilateral trade cooperation to a new level. Berdimukhamedov, in turn, expressed interest in working closely. With China on a natural gas pipeline project, Xinhua reported. In December 2005, Kazakhstani President Nursultan Nazarbayev inaugurated a Tasu Alishanku pipeline to ship oil to China. The $800 million Atasu Alishanku route still needs Russian crude oil from western Siberia, transported via the Omsk Pavlodar Shymkent pipeline, to reach its full annual capacity of 20 million tons by 2010. Although China and its Central Asian partners view their expanding cooperation as a means of diversifying their energy partnerships, Russia has enjoyed success in other major energy projects. In November 2007, two Russian companies TNKBP and Gazpromneft signed an agreement with Kaztransoil to ship up to 5 million tons of oil annually to China via the Omsk Pavlodar Atasu Alanshaku pipeline. In the first quarter of 2008, 300,000 tons of Russian crude oil were exported to China along this route. Moreover, a Russian engineering company, Stroytransgaz, won a tender to build Turkmenistan's section of the gas pipeline to China. Latest developments in May 2014 announced that China and Russia reached a 30 year gas deal where Russia would supply 38 billion cubic meters of natural gas each year to China. These developments continue to show Russia and China's attempts to work together outside of USA confinements. Topic: <trade>, Trade in national currencies. On November 23, 2010, at a meeting of the Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and the Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao, it was announced that Russia and China have decided to use their own national currencies for bilateral trade, instead of the US dollar. The move is aimed to further improve the relations between Beijing and Moscow and to protect their domestic economies in the conditions of the world financial crisis. The trading of the Chinese yuan against the Russian ruble has started in the Chinese interbank market, while the yuan's trading against the ruble started on the Russian foreign exchange market in December 2010. In coordination with other emerging economies, the second BRIC summit was held in Brasilia in April 2010. In 2014, Beijing and Moscow signed a 150 billion yuan central bank liquidity swap line agreement to get around American sanctions on their behaviors. In December 2014, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi pledged to offer financial support to Russia and support the ruble if needed, in light of the currency's depreciation. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Military relations. After the EU arms embargo on China imposed as a consequence of the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989, China became a reliable client for Russian military exports, making up 25 to 50 percent of all foreign military sales. On November 9, 1993, Russian Defense Minister Pavel Grayshev and Chinese Defense Minister Qi Haoshan signed a five-year defense cooperation agreement paving the way for an increase in the number of military attaches stationed in their respective capitals. On July 12, 1994 the Russian and Chinese defense ministers signed a border security agreement designed to prevent potentially dangerous military incidents, such as unintentional radar jamming and airspace violations. On October 19, 1999, Defense Minister of China, General Qi Haoshan, after meeting with Syrian Defense Minister Mustafa Lass in Damascus, Syria to discuss expanding military ties between Syria and China, flew directly to Israel and met with Ehud Barak, the then Prime Minister and Defense Minister of Israel where they discussed military relations. 
Among the military arrangements was a $1 billion Israeli-Russian sale of military aircraft to China, which were to be jointly produced by Russia and Israel. In 2004, the Russian Foreign Ministry blocked both the sale of the Su-35 and Tupolev Tu-22M bombers to China over concerns about the arrangements for Chinese production of the Sukhoi Su-27SK, known as the Shenyang J-11. Originally, the licensing agreement required that engines and avionics be sourced by Russian suppliers, however, by 2004 these components were being produced domestically. Currently, China focuses on domestic weapon designs and manufacturing, while still importing certain military products from Russia, such as jet engines. China decided to become independent in its defense sector and become competitive in global arms markets. Its defense sector is rapidly developing and maturing. Gaps in certain capability remain, most notably in the development of some sophisticated electronic systems and sufficiently reliable and powerful propulsion systems, but China's defense industry is now producing warships and submarines, land systems and aircraft that provide the Chinese armed forces with a capability edge over most military operating in the Asia-Pacific. Where indigenous capability still falls short, China procures from Russia and, until local industry eventually bridges the gap, it hopes that quantity will overcome quality. China's 2015 defense white paper called for "...independent innovation," and the "...sustainable development," of advanced weaponry and equipment. Mutual perceptions by the country's populations In October 2018, the Moscow Times reported that, three quarters of Russians polled by the independent Levada Center said they view China in a positive light. Only 12% of Russian respondents said they disliked China. See also Foreign relations of Russia Russia-Indonesia relations Sino-Soviet relations History of Sino-Russian relations <laughs>